call the meeting to order. Any uh, changes to the agenda? All right, hearing none, I'll deem it approved. So comments from the chair. Um, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so you'll have to bear with me as we continue through the punch list. Um, thank you for continuing on in my absence. We don't have John Adams here tonight, and Kim will be leaving us early, yeah. I believe. So, um, I guess, Kim, if there's anything that you want to talk about well, now thank before. You. Well, first of all, I want to know to whom invitations were sent for the meeting. Well, we can touch that when we. In particular, I want to know if you were invited. Executive director of the So I left the list to Mike and Jamie, but I can extend an invitation to anyone that was admitted. So if we need to add someone, if we need to add the executive director of public safety. You know. Well, it's a modest problem. It only takes about 70% of the city budget. So it's probably okay. worth discussing. Okay. <laughs> whether there should be a plan for it or not. So I may just ask Jamie to f send me the list of names. Yeah, yeah, she'll be able to tell you. <laughs> and as I wrote you, the uh, I don't think I have a lot to add on menu venue for the meeting. But if, and I thought most of the suggestions or corrections were well taken. I just had a few queries. And that seemed to me the substantive yeah. part of tonight's meeting. Okay. That's all I have. So we'll move on to item four, which is general business. Comments from the public about something not on the agenda. So we have one member of the public here. I have a comment about something that is on the agenda. It is on the, so which item is um, it? Um, the, uh, the steep slopes. The steep slopes one, okay. You know, sort of agreeing with the staff comments that, you know, anything above, basically my name is Bill Shave and I'm on the contractor here in town and uh, there's a lot of time for presenting, you know, situations on the state. We live probably in, aren't hearing you on the TV, so if you mind just introducing yourself again. My name is Will Shabaum. Uh, I'm a general contractor here in town, and there's a lot of times where we come up against a situation where there is a portion of a project that is greater than, the slopes are greater than 30%, and so um, I think just agreeing with staff's suggestion that anything greater than 30% be you know, either engineered, conditional, but you know, basically removing the no development at all. The prohibition. Yeah, exactly. So that was pretty much, I just want to. Okay. Great. And then, I mean, we should be getting to that pretty quickly in our punch list. Yeah. So if you want to stick around, we can, you can be part of the discussion. Yeah. You think like within a few minutes or so? Or? Probably 10, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. I don't know. It's hard to estimate, but. Yeah. Okay. What number was it on the list? It looks like it's number 32. Well, we should get that it comes 30. up twice, once in 26 and once in 32. So we'll okay. Yeah, it's the first item on this punch yeah. list to get to. Is, is that right, Mike, that we, every yeah, 26 is where one. we're starting? Yeah. Yeah. So you just get to hear a couple updates first, and then we'll yeah, get back to that. Good. Thank you. All right, and there's no other members of the public here, so safe to assume we don't have any other comments. Um, it's not on the agenda. So then item five, Kirby, I believe this is for you. Yes, I'm up? trying to remember from a week ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry um, to. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so yeah, it says that um, I'm gonna give an update on some discussions that are happening at the Regional Planning Commission level. Um, I think as I, I uh, told you guys, uh, I think a meeting two ago that um, I started working with the regional plan 
committee of the Regional Planning Commission. And so we're looking at the regional plan and um, the first thing we're kind of tackling is this um, preferred site review for renewable projects. So the background here is that up until very recently, the state kind of precluded local government from having much say in any kind of renewable energy planning, site planning. Uh, but that's kind of changed in the, rec in the last couple of recent years um, so that there's this process for uh, preferred sites for renewables. And it's for projects that are 150 um, kilowatt capacity or more. So that's not that big of a project. So, so quite, a, quite a lot of projects fall into this. <coughs> and, and basically, they're only allowed to be, or there, there's certain benefits of being put in a preferred site. And so there's a lot of incentive to, to for these to be preferred sites, and they're for the larger ones, 150 kilowatts. I think they, they have to be in a preferred site actually. Um, and so municipalities are getting some control over what a preferred site is. So there's a state list of what preferred sites are for every town, but then towns themselves can also expand that list to ha have more preferred sites. Uh, and if they don't do that, there's this other process, this letter process for a municipality and the Regional Planning Commission to work together to sort of, on a case-by-case -case basis through a letter, call a site preferred. So that's the kind of process that we're looking at for the Regional Planning Commission. Um, so to give you an update on what we're thinking about for these preferred sites is that uh, right now it looks like we'll look at whether there's a certified energy plan as part of the town plan and if, it, and if there is one and it includes preferred sites that aren't on the state list, we'll just give automatic deference. And that'll be, because that'll be something that was already vetted by the Regional Planning Commission. But in cases where that isn't the case, we'll, we do plan to look at the process that a municipality uses when they're considering a kind of ad hoc preferred site. And that's what we're gonna be working through with the, um, this subcommittee for over the next few months, really. Uh, figuring out what we want the Regional Planning Commission to consider. But we but we have agreed that we think that the municipality should follow a certain process and that there should it shouldn't be just a, he's a nice guy, so we said that his site was preferred. It was like that there's an actual process to it. Um, and I took that from a real life example. That, <laughs> it's an anecdotal one, but um, so, so we know that that's possible. So that's what we're working on. So if you have any ideas about or any interest in preferred sites for renewable plants, just let me know and I'll make sure that I go back with that feedback. There, were, there was originally a set of criteria that would identify sites that were either preferred or not preferred, correct? So preferred sites could not be ones that were designated wetlands. And uh, there's a whole, did you talk about that list that we talked about in the Energy Committee at all? I remember there was a survey that we completed that touched on that. Right, and there were some um, changes to that, right. So in terms of developing the maps of the preferred sites, there were certain criteria that would automatically be put some areas out, out of considerations. Slopes, high, high so elevation, that kind of thing. As of right now, there's not any municipality in the region that has a certified energy plan that actually identifies anything other than the state designated preferred sites. Right, but when the Regional Planning Commission designated the preferred sites at the beginning, it was based on a list of criteria. As it was explained to me, it's the, the state did that. The Regional Planning Commission hasn't done that. But they developed the maps, so did they just develop them in relation to what the state said? I mean, it's probably... We were just told the state did it, but maybe there was some input from regional commission. Yeah, we had a whole about. slug of, originally, um, as we were working on the energy plan, we got a bunch of different maps that identified preferred areas in each municipality. But there were certainly some areas that, that could not, mm -hmm. you know, that were automatically not preferred. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that was defined by this list of exclusions. I believe they were mm -hmm. all exclusions. So you might want to take a look at that, and also was in that list derived after the survey from the survey res results. I think it was an addition that or there was already a list, and then the survey happened, and okay. some additional things may have been added to it. 
Um, it's only about maybe 10 or 12 specific. I'll mm. dig that up and see if I can find it. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> funny. I actually don't know a lot about this, the state designated sites right now. I mean, we were told that um, rooftops and things like that are al already on the list. So, I mean, I asked about as that. Preferred as preferred or as not preferred. preferford uh -huh. so um, Brown field. Brown yeah. field to gravel yeah, pits. Right. Prime parking lots. They want to avoid prime ag being considered preferred. And right. Like but, the, yeah, I mean, there were other yeah. set issues of, of steep slopes, and, as I remember, that mm -hmm. were criteria that would exclude certain areas. So, so far, you know, we haven't even we haven't gone into everything that we want to look at. But as far as the regional review process, we want to make sure that, yeah, the town follows some kind of process and that it looks, it considers at least some factors. And I was pushing using like a rational basis test, basically, if the town can show that there was a rational basis for considering a site um, approved based on all these different categories, something along those lines. One of them, for instance, being like transmission, that they at least, there's at least a rational basis mm -hmm. that either the grid can handle this where it is or there's a storage plan or just as, as long as there's a, a, a rational basis for this being a preferred site can, when it comes to transmission and then looking at all these other things too. Or rational reason for it not to be a preferred site. There seem to be some efforts in the in the energy committee, some concerns about sites that municipalities did not want to be included. As far as I understand this process, if the municipality has denied it, then they won't be asking for this letter and the Regional Planning Commission won't get involved. Hmm. Mike, I'm just noticing, this is non sequitur, but I'm just noticing the, the printed minutes we have to review are the, not a date that matches the wrong date. So. We could. If there's a good moment to print a different one later, we can. If not, we can just wait and do the minutes at the next meeting. Date on that one. Kim was looking at it. Yeah. Yes. July 11th or June 11th? June, it says June 11th. It's, yeah, these are the June 11th minutes. Oh. Anyway, okay. So that's, that's my report. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks for that. All right. Item six, city plan update discussion. So I forwarded the email that I was blind copied on from Jamie Granfield to the various committees. Um, so I don't know who was on that list because of the way it was sent. Um, but I assume we have a list somewhere of the people... <laughs> I'm sure Jamie has it, if Jamie no one else. Jamie has it, yeah. So we can verify. Um, so it went out on Thursday. The meeting's happening August 13th at the pavilion. I already got one RSVP from Kate Stevens. Awesome. Kate Stevenson. Um, from the Energy, Energy Committee. Or MIAC. MIAC. Montpelier Energy, Energy Advisory, Advisory Committee. Yeah. Um, and I assume more will follow. Um, yeah, that was about basically it. One one question I had for you, Mike, was whether the city council had been alerted of that letter going out, and if not, would you pass it on just so they're notified of where we are in the process? I know I talked about it with Jamie, but we'll make sure they, Thank they get you. sent as well. Um, and then the other question for you is, is it possible to post that letter and the attached memo on our website so that the public can see what was sent out and what will be taking place uh, August 13th? Okay. And then I saw that John Adams sent around a website for us to start working on it's not public facing yet or I mean maybe it could be if we shared the link but for now we can hold that off on sharing it while we work on it internally and then we can figure out how we want to use that website for the process but um, we really should talk about that at well we don't have any more meetings before August 13th do we right. <laughs> 
We talked about that last time a little bit, though. Did you? Yeah, John okay. went through it. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I wasn't there for that. So, so. it was the next meeting, the 13th? Mm-hmm. It's good. We can listen. We don't need to talk. <laughs> that's right. Although we yeah. were, are we giving some sort of presentation? Because then we need to plan that out. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's true. We do. Yeah, we're planning to... Um, I didn't grab a copy of the letter, but you have the, the dra it's a draft from earlier, it has the wrong thing. Um, we have, we're going to initiate the meeting by going through, going over kind of expectations. Thank you. Was there any discussion of showing the video of the talk we heard the TED talk? We, well, we've talked about that, but I, I, the concern I have is time. Oh, I was going to do it before the meeting. Anybody wants to see it, fine. Send a link out, you mean? Oh. To the... No, play it at the pavilion. If you, I don't know what time the meeting is scheduled for. I haven't read this, but... It's scheduled to start at 6. 6. So we could show the, anybody wants to come at 5, they could see the TED Talk. Well, we don't have the space reserved earlier. Yeah. I suppose we could Is that a problem? see about that. Well, I don't know. I just thought it was a good kickoff idea. Yeah. So TED, TED Talks are short. No, well, it was an hour. It is an hour? That one wasn't, was it? I think it was only, I mean, I remember watching most of it anyway. Maybe 12 minutes, something like that? It's close to an hour. Mm. Um, also, the, in terms of the connection to the inter internet, I think we'd have to really know whether we're going to do that or not. And then Kirby would have to <laughs> yeah. jump in to. I, I mean, uh, I, th I think it's considered closed at 4 30, so we'd have to like extend our reservation to, to, to include 5 to 6, if that makes sense. Because I'm sorry, who closes? The state, you know, the state closes the pavilion at 4.30, so if there's anything happening there after 4.30, they're paying for security. So we'd have to extend our reservation for an hour, and they'd charge us for the security for it. We could talk about that TED Talk in our introductory remarks and then share that, the link with everyone and we can line up another event where we can screen it here pretty easily um, as a compromise. I'm just, I'm really worried about time and I think that the real benefit of this meeting is having everyone in the same room talking. So that's that's the why I'm a little hesitant to prioritize showing the, the film. That's my thought, but I'm well, One in a my view is that it's purely voluntary if you wanted to come early and yeah. see it, fine. Kind of sets the stage in terms of what, what yeah. we might be thinking. See it. I have to be coordinated with the people that do all the video, too. So currently we have it scheduled for 6 till when? 9. But I think the letter said 6 to 8. So well, the meeting will be from 6 to 8, and then we're inviting people to stay till 9 to socialize should they want to. So we could do it after the meeting ends at 8. Cut it. Cut. Well, a link might do it. I mean, uh, yeah. So people, I don't know. I just thought it was a good keynote address. Yeah, I agree that it should be shown. I guess the big question is, is just when. Is, could that be shown as part of a second, a follow-up meeting with all of the various committees. Yeah, we don't have to accomplish everything in one meeting. That's a good point. Because right now they're just sort of bringing in these splinters of information for us. Um, but it might be also, you know... Well, the general theory that it's harder to get a bad idea out of your mind than a good one in it. Oh. I would just as soon have a good idea put out at the beginning. First, I see. Yeah. And then you can work on it from there. I think at the very least it could be a backup plan in case... We're not able to fill up the time. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, it would require some coordination with a lot of people, and I don't know how 
feasible it is. Well, we might be able to just show an excerpt of it at the beginning as part of it, but it would require the connection and the person who knows how to do it. As I recall, it's not. It wouldn't be as simple as just having people show. Yeah, because we're like we would plan a stream. To talk. Yeah. Currently, people at the committees are going to get their presentations to Stephanie, and then you're going to put them all together. And so, will they? How will they be coming in to the pavilion? I've never gotten on Wi-Fi at the pavilion, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure either. I can bring them. And I, well, do we have, is there a computer there that we can use? Do we need to be plugging in one of our own computers? I'll double check what I put down for the reservation. The state doesn't like jump drives. They don't? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Typically not. Uh -huh. Well, it's going to be a lot easier to have But we can one. sort that out. Yeah, it'll. Yeah. Rather than everybody bringing in their laptop. Yeah, no, they're sending everything to Leslie. She was going to shoot it to me, and I'm going to put them. Yeah. We're going to make sure everyone's in a certain order. And yeah. um, I think that my, my vision is that I will introduce myself and our group. I will talk about the purpose of the meeting, to just get ideas, share ideas, have, start our discussions. Um, I will explain how once we've heard from everybody, we're going to talk a little bit more about how we want to structure the information in the city plan itself, and Mike can give more details about that, just walking people through the memo that you sent out. I don't think you really need to prepare much. Um, and then we can give some examples of of this in one could be this TED talk. There was another video that you shared. Yeah, um, that could be a follow-up. I'm not sure how much duplication there might be between Ed McMahon, what he discusses, and this. It's more of an example in terms of how cities turn themselves around. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think Ed McMahon's discussion is more general. Yeah. in terms of how cities can set themselves up rather than a specific city turning themselves around. And that might be, you know, something to follow up with or provide people with a link. Okay. The message is really quite simple. Good planning is the key to successful economic development. Yes, but what is good planning? Well, it's <laughs> That's making the harder desirable part. place desirable for people to be in. Yeah. And yeah, that's and the, emphasizing your assets, working on, on what we have. That's the simple message. It gets a little more complicated. You know, and I, yeah, I think it's possible to, to pull out an excerpt of his in longer discussion. So if we could incorporate that, that would be great. So getting back to the technical for a second, I put down that we prefer a projector and projector screen, but she didn't really confirm that. So I can follow up, but what... What do we want? Well, if we, if they have a screen at least. Yeah. They, they do. The screen is built in. Yeah, the screen built is built in. in, okay. So if they have a projector, we can plug the computer into. That's fine. Okay. I can bring my laptop. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we want to just bring our own hardware and? I can grab one for, for backup, but I don't, uh, without having gone in there to, to set up and test everything. Okay. That can be. Okay, so I'll, I will. I'll look at it. A little bit on the fly. If there's a chance, if you could just step in to take a look at it. Where's your office? Um, I can walk through a tunnel and get over there. I don't even have to go outside. Oh, well. So you can stay in the air-conditioned comfort? Is that it? If you call it tunnel, air-conditioned comfort. Do they okay. air-condition the tunnel? <laughs> below ground. It's below <laughs> ground, that's right. Um, just to, because I, my suspicion is that the projector is mounted like this one, but mm -hmm. um, given how much it's been used for the film festival and everything. Okay. But it'd be good to check. Sure. See what the interface is and everything. Um, and I think after we talked about these concepts, we'll then have John Adams maybe just introduce this shared website idea and say that we'll, you know, as we start moving forward with some work, we will develop that more and everyone can just stay tuned. 
but before the committees present or I was thinking after after okay I, I don't want to do too much before they present I just right. want to they'll be thinking know. about their presentations and too nervous to listen yeah exactly I think I mean it's all about hearing from them so I don't want to detract from that right. and then after they're done talking we can say that we can explain that we're, we're thinking about these goals in this context this how to emphasize Montpelier's assets and so hearing about the assets that they've identified is really critical um, and that there are tools to if they want to see more on this concept they can and hear the URLs um, we're going to be thinking about those goals in the context of change or maintain evolve transform which is the memo that Mike wrote and we shared the extent that people have questions about that you can field those um, and then we're going to be trying to have tra a transparent information sharing process by having this website and we haven't we haven't filled it with content yet because that's what this whole process is about to you know that's what we're trying to do so that's that's kind of how I'm, I'm seeing it go does it make sense to as we're going along I mean the other committees won't know what each committee's three goals are necessarily here, but we'll have it all on the presentations. Does it make sense to at least do a handout or something so that they could be looking at these goals and then seeing how they interface with their own committee? If we get presentations by August 10th, as I request. That's an old one, so it may not have the right date yeah. on it. Um, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I asked for them by August 10th, which I thought was pretty reasonable because, yes, August 10th, um, then that would be great. But if I don't get them until the day of, then we're not going to be able to do that. It just won't be possible. Yeah, I just wonder if it's even makes sense to have somebody, you know, with a flip chart just up there writing down, you know, this, this committee's three goals. Do we have big... Yeah, there's a lot of those kicking around. These? Yep. Yeah. Can we bring one? I think that's a great Just idea. Just in case. Yeah. Barb, do you want to be our scribe? Sure. Are you up for that? Yes. And not everyone's going to have a presentation, so if they don't and they're just talking, mm -hmm. it'll be helpful to get that down. Right, right. But we won't do anything more elaborate on this list other than the three goals. We won't do their, their whole description. But I think it always helps me to have a visual mm -hmm. to say, oh, look, that one looks like this one. So I'd be happy to do all of them, even the ones we might gotten be great. in a timely manner. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and does anyone want to volunteer to be the timekeeper? <laughs> <laughs> How about Mike? No, Mike, Mike no. needs to listen. Yeah, okay. I, I think I can do that. Okay. Well, you do it in a nice way. Give it a way. stab. Yeah. Make like signs. Yes. 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 Like yeah, one yeah. minute yeah. signs. One minute. Yeah. yeah. And they have a total of five. Five minutes. Yeah. yeah. So just a one minute remaining and then right. time's up. Right. Yeah. And then, so then how are you going to interrupt them? With a sign. Well, with, yeah, I guess with the sign, I, how, how aggressive do I need to be? Because <laughs> I just think that people ignore them. I mean, the right. one minute yeah. they might pay attention to, but once they're out of time, how intense do we want to be yeah, about it? I can say, wrap it up. Okay. I'm happy to do that. You can be the heavy. I'll be the heavy. <laughs> you hold the sign, and I will. Okay. I will say yeah, she's been holding you, the yeah, sign for a while. You walk up. Yeah. Sometimes you just walk up and stand beside them to go and introduce the next person. Oh yeah. <laughs> they kind of get the <laughs> message so at the time for. Yeah. Start yes. playing some music in the background. Yeah. 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 Right. Like they do at the awards yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. You thanked your mom. Move on. Yeah, and, and we can always come back. I mean, if we have a smaller group, we can always come back. I just want to make sure everyone gets their time, and we have 12 groups or something. The number of people, I mean, if, when you ask Jamie, she'll probably give you a number of people that, there's at least 12, but there may be more. Maybe more. Yeah, and we're going to need a, a time to switch over between, so it's not just, you know, five minutes after five minutes. So. Well, no, no, that's why Stephanie's going to... I know, but people have to actually physically be able to um, to move. To move, yeah. I mean, it doesn't. It won't take that long, but people should be ready because they'll know what order, right? We'll have an agenda of some type that will tell them the order. Um, I guess it depends on who asks for RSVPs. I've asked for an RSVP by August sixth. 
I'll just put together a list of names and then um, I'm happy to MC it and say, Kate, you're next. Barb, you're on deck. Mm, okay. You better get ready. Yeah, right. Be thinking about it. Okay. Come on up here. Start, yeah, start panicking. Yes. You can give the people. Okay, Barb, actually... you're up, and Kirby, you're on deck. I mean, that's how so we... the people who respond get to go first. And then the ones who are. Right, if there's anybody else at the end, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if when, when you get the list of who it was sent to, it would be helpful to have that full committee list. So if someone does show up, we're like, oh, wait, oh, that committee, okay. Yeah. They didn't RSVP, but the, the We did. One. Mike did share a list with us previously, a committee list. Right. Um, we have a lot of committees. And then there are some groups that are not necessarily city committees that are being invited, right? Montpelier Live? Uh, yeah, MDC, Montpelier Live. Um, Kim was just talking about having the CVPSA invited. Mm -hmm. Would they be doing the presentation? I mean, I think they could. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I would be, at this point, I would probably keep it open to anyone who yeah. is... Wants to come and who's an appointed yeah. group and, and wants to have their goals presented to the planning commission for consideration in the plan. This is their opportunity. Yeah, from a committee standpoint, yes, and then we'll get to the public comments mm -hmm. after we've compiled them. And if anyone is dying to make some remarks, let me know. I figured you probably aren't. <laughs> so, okay. Well, good work, everyone. Thanks for all of that. Um, oh, one other note on that. We, were, we had talked about the survey, but... Do we abandon that? Have we talked about has the group talked about that at the last meeting at all? Or? No, I think I was waiting for comments and I forgot about it because I, I sent it to you and John. Yeah, and I forgot to send you comments. Okay. It's extremely basic, but it's okay. a good I think it would be a good starting point for getting initial input. So And it's a public thing more than a committee thing, so if we it's not it. out with this meeting, mm -hmm. I think that's okay. Yeah, I think we can I think that's what some of the things I think John was trying to work on were ways of having that extra space, the Google space, be able to have inter interact with. So that might be a good place okay. to have it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess the only other thing was that you wanted to have the social time afterwards so yes. that people could talk. How can we make that work at the pavilion? Just out in the lobby? Um, we just, we just we open it up. We have the pavilion till, yeah. no, till 9. Yeah. Right, right. It, it's, you know, it's set up sort of as a fixed seats auditorium. So, um, people I mean, just stand up to, and. Do we want people to be interacting in front of everyone or just individually? What do you think? What do you Was mean? the idea that it would be one on one discussions or that there would be people might get up and address the group? Oh, no, I was thinking much less formal than that. Right, I so was it'd just be thinking one on one. Yeah. Just chatting with. People so we could set up some refreshments out in the lobby. It's a pretty big lobby area. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, people can mill around. I did put down that we might have refreshments. Yeah. And they did not shoot that down. No. So no one told me no. So. But they do. I think they're <laughs> intense about it not being in the auditorium itself. Oh, okay. I That's think. But you might thinking. check with them and see just because, yeah. Though it seems sensible that we just put it out in the lobby. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen refreshments It's more, out there. you know, personal out there. So, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. <coughs> okay. I think we've established that that planning is not my forte. So. <laughs> what kind of refreshments, Barb? Thing. It's just fine. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what was that? What kind of refreshments should we get, Barb? I don't know. What does Mike have <laughs> in uh, his? We, whoever wants to go and take. And make a run with refreshments, I'm sure we can come up with the budget for whatever, 40, 50 bucks. Or would you be willing to well, take that Okay, on? but just give me a clue. Are we talking pizza? Are we talking about dinner here? Or are we talking about snacks? 
fifty dollars. The meeting is six to eight, and then refreshments from eight to nine. So, pizza might it might be a little late for pizza. But yeah, maybe I think nine. so. I think so. So maybe snacks. Snacks and drinks. I would think. And drinks. Mm -hmm. Snacks and drinks. Okay. Thank you. Fifty sure. bucks will go really far at the liquor store if you get all bottom shelf stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Or samples. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's item six. Item seven. Continue review of punch list for zoning fixes. So we're going to get to the slopes now, just so everyone wakes up out there. <laughs> yeah. So My printing missed the last page, but we'll get that for you next time. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to get all the way through. Yeah, we won't get all the way through. Okay, so item 26 is also connected to item 32. Mike, is that right? Yeah, they're two, they're both related to steep slopes. Um, but they're looking at it in two different places. So we had removed steep slopes um, from the areas for calculating density. This is background for the newer Thank members. <laughs> um, and the policy rationale was for that was that we didn't, we heard a lot of feedback from members of the public that they didn't want to see a really large uh, building squished into one corner of the lot. At least that's my recollection, and please correct me if you... Well, I think when we set the density levels, mm -hmm. we were assuming that it would only be on a developable part of right. the property, yeah. rather than if you have a cliff and you include that in, then it, you know, it could then end you up... Then you can end up... You would end up with a lot more units, potentially. Yeah, in, and, one, in one little small area that you can actually build on. Right. So that was the rationale behind it. Um, but we don't have a slope map, apparently, which we talked about yeah. a little bit. Yeah, it's I just know we're getting is, LIDAR. Well, we do have the LIDAR, and we have the data. I mean, we've got, we've got the data. John's beautiful map there. John's beautiful map. We've got the data. The issue is when you have... When it gets down to the real world and you've got a map and somebody says, you know, how many, you know, how much buildable land is is here or here or here, and it's it's not like there's a line that you can just go through and take GIS and draw a box and say, okay, well, it's you know, this is the buildable area. It's it's scattered out, very pixelated. It makes it very difficult to make any type of interpretation. Um, and determinations on those, and we successfully defeated every large computer to be able to get that data digested down into a into an Excel sheet. So we asked, could you guys tell us what percentage of land or how much land is on each parcel and put that into an Excel, then, then our staff can just look at the Excel database and say, oh, okay, this number of square feet, they couldn't do it. it was John good. seemed to indicate that there was a computer solution to this well there's a so there are different factors we have one is where is um, this is just this piece here that we're looking at is just the amount of buildable area mm -hmm. um, we know visually where steep slopes are to be able to go and say you can't build on a steep slope but we can't calculate how much of the parcel contains that steep slope to subtract that out of the buildable area. But using a CAD program that should be but I thought the challenge was to do. from John that they weren't necessarily all connected polygons so you couldn't because in GIS if it was like one polygon you could cut out this space and calculate what what it was. But I think he was saying the data doesn't Yeah this work data at that just level. just is so pixelated and because it's you know one meter resolution you might have on a two acre parcel, you might have 70 or 80 parcels of steep slope. Pieces. Pieces yeah, but, yeah. within that one parcel, and we just can't calculate that. 
Well, I think one of the things we talked about last time, too, was having engineered drawings, in which case the engineer could make that determination using... Yeah, and cat. this is just where things get vastly and insanely out of control from an administration standpoint. Yes, we could burden every applicant with coming up with hiring... If they have steep slopes on their lot. It doesn't matter. Almost every parcel has at least one square, and we can't determine whether there mm -hmm. is or isn't without them going through and hiring an engineer to certify that it isn't. And that's where we just get really frustrated trying to try to administer these rules because we just, even some of the more basic ones, um, just very quickly get, um, you know, simple subdivisions stop being simple subdivisions. Even when, even when you know you've got enough land, you still have to hire the engineer to go and certify because nobody, we can't, you can't just go and say, oh, buy it by eyeball. Well, it meets in, it. in a subdivision, they would be hiring an engineer anyway to do their site plan. So most of the, those projects, would, it would just be another step in the engineering process. Should we hear from... The member of the public now. It seems like an appropriate time to learn about on the ground problems. Well, yeah, I mean, I think some projects, you know, I mean, I'm not in large scale development, you know, we're not trying to build multiple cluster units and stuff, you know, it's more like remodels, single family projects. You know. Can you get a little closer to the mic? Yeah. Thanks. Um, and so I think, as Mike said, technically, probably every lot in the city has some parcel of you know something that's over steeps 30 percent so um, yeah in a lot of projects you know we don't hire engineers it's like you know they're doing in addition we know where the lot lines are we're not necessarily wanting to do a topography survey and um, it's it just does it does make it challenging to a certain extent and i think like what as mike was saying you know it's it's everywhere and it's and there's a lot of not non-connected you know like if you had a room this size you know you could have one little portion here one little portion there one little portion here but you want to put something kind of in the middle of them you know but technically you can't do that because it's disturbing something greater than 30 percent so it has sorry has, so has the results of this been that either things haven't been built or have they been that you had to go get an engineer or something else? Uh, I'm Currently, it hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, as of now, you know, projects that I've been working on have been permitted prior to the adoption of the new regulations. We just finished a house that technically under the new regulations wouldn't have been allowed um, because of slopes. You know, and there's some parts of that project that the, the homeowners would want to renovate in the future. There's a retaining wall, for instance, that, you know, as, as it's probably more like a 99%. It's not totally straight. <laughs> um, and that's, the, that's the, one of the things is, you know, because of it's not totally, it goes more of a temporary um, element. You know, they might still be able to get that in under their previous zoning permit because I think of a two-year. But, uh, you know, there's a few other projects coming up. In the, in the pipelines that I've got, you know, whereas, like, we're not doing a huge portion of, you know, I understand the, the idea of not wanting to disturb slopes for, you know, erosion control and just keeping some hillsides and stuff, but where it's like, you know, if, for instance, you had, like, this corner of the room back was steep, but you wanted to put an addition right here, you'd have to develop a very small portion of that slope to get that in there. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I think it's a good idea to have it be conditional um, with engineer plans, you know, or topography surveys. One project that I do, that we have in the works, we do have a, a one-foot contour topography survey, you know, so we do know that it is steep, and we know where it is and what percentages, but we'd still like to be able to, you know, it's it's a it's a small hill that comes close to primarily flat, and uh, you know the patterns of development around that. You know, there's a garage tucked into sort of a steep area, and then the house is kind of tucked into the hill. Um, to be able to sort of work that in a smart design sense, so that was really one of the criteria that we were looking at was to to mimic existing development patterns yeah. because we don't have very many houses built on. 30% slopes yeah. that are still there anyway. Yeah. 
There's um, there's some. <laughs> but you know, Will had a project on on Elm Street, which was an infill in into an existing structure. So there's no new structure built, just adding two two units to an existing building, and still had to demonstrate the buildable area requirements. Because of the density. Even though there was no building being built, it's just an infill project, but you've got to demonstrate the density. Right, because we want to make sure that the density, you know, that we don't just take one building even if we don't expand it and suddenly turn it into six units, and that changes the whole character of that neighborhood then. Um, so it's... Well, if it's allowed, the question would be if it's allowed, if it's an allowed use... Right, I'm just saying and that if the they bulk don't and massing the, of the building don't exceed the bulk and massing of... But See, the, I think what was tried to get captured with this was solved better with the, the, the footprint. We fixed one problem twice. So the, my thought is I, I don't know if we even need the buildable area requirements coming out. It's good, just going to require a lot more... As you said, a lot more engineering and work that's going to go into every project. Um, so let me ask a question. If you have a project where you're putting an addition on and it's possible that the addition is going to be coming very close to a setback, wouldn't you get an engineered drawing? Well, for a, for a property line setback. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the engineer is already looking at the site plan. Yeah. For yeah. You. But I mean, you know, a, a, a boundary line survey versus a topography does yeah. up the cost, you know. It's not, yeah, but it, sh it shouldn't be that much more yeah. complex for what they're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, they have the, as long as they have the information, yeah. and technically with our LIDAR, we thought that they would have the information. Yeah. I guess mine and my, sounds like from you guys, you know, Mike was saying it's like, it's only, it's what, one meter resolution? Yeah, I mean, we've got really detailed data, um, you know, and in, in the, as we said, the two questions that kind of come up, one is, yeah, that's, that's the city-wide one. This was just a blow-up that we had for a different I've project. looked at this one online. And, you know, and I think keeping the, you know, keeping the patterns of development as they are, for the most part, makes sense. But there's a lot of lots you know, within town that are... I mean, I understand not wanting to clear-cut for us and put rows of big, unnecessary, non-appropriate development, but... Or moving a 30% slope that's already there, just moving it to the property line, so that you can create a flat area to develop on. Yeah. I think that's that becomes an issue too, and we've yeah. seen some developments in the city that yep. that happens. So, Mike, will you walk us through the staff recommendation here, I mean, so we understand what we're what we're looking at? Yeah, I mean, in in the very least, I think there there needs to be something. I mean, some changes that we could make if you're looking at small changes. If you wanted to keep the buildable areas, we could remove some other areas. Urban already urban center, riverfront, and MUR are exempt, but we could also exempt some of these smaller res 1500 or res 3000. But it almost districts. sounds like you're recommending we get rid of this altogether. I would get rid of it altogether because I think the what we were concerned about when we got into the residential density was something like Sibley Street, where we had a one-acre parcel in a neighborhood of 6,000 square foot, and somebody wanted to put in a 16-unit building, a mm -hmm. large building that was going to be completely out of scale. The new zoning, and it had a steep slope, so the one way of doing it would be to go and say, well, you can't count the steep slopes, we just count what's buildable, and you can build just based on the top of the hill. And we also set rules that said you can't have buildings that are any bigger than a certain mass. So we set footprint sizes and we set height, height sizes for buildings. So you can't have an oversized building anymore. So I think it was kind of fixed twice. Um, it does, it would increase the amount of buildable stuff in some of these districts. Um, but I just, we do as I said, I know to a certain extent, I know, Barb, you're not concerned about adding more engineering costs and engineering time to projects, but we just see so many projects that just come in and we just we just roll our eyes to go and say, you gotta hire an engineer. You gotta hire an engineer. But all I wanna do is add an apartment to my to, to this third unit. And we're like, yeah, but you've got some steep slopes and we gotta have you go and do the engineering analysis on this. But so, it could be a very small piece of But that. these are people who aren't hiring an engineer at all. 
No, I know. They wouldn't engineer. actually have to even have a site plan is what you're saying. But what they might have to have it is an engineer, you know, scan it, look at it on, on the computer, determine the, what percentage of the site was over 30% and go from there. Um, and they might be able to just make a determination that it's a very small area. So engineer aside for a moment, <laughs> I'm trying to understand, it sounds like we have some protections in place to ensure that buildings are of a similar size and scale massing to their neighboring, and this is really just focusing on density calculations. This this particular concern we're talking about right now is just about the density. And I hate using that metric, <laughs> I really do, because if, if you think about how the building looks and how it fits into the neighborhood, then it doesn't matter how many people are living in there, in, from my perspective. But it's, it's determined by its, its uh, particular zoning district in terms of how many people can be living in there. Yep. So there is still some determination. I guess my concern is that take, you know, with Sibley Street, if we take 30% slopes out of there, they could develop that entire property and they could put all 16 units on it. They just have to break it up into small units, smaller buildings. But at a certain point, they're going to the just slope. run out most projects don't will will never end up building out their potential, especially if you still have to meet all those rules. We still say you can't build on the thirty percent slopes without. I was just going to say, so the engineering, the the hiring an engineer is going to happen regardless of whether it's going to happen if you want to build have, on thirty percent slope. If you have slopes. parcels that have thirty percent so, slope and not thirty percent slope, and you came in to put in a project and you said. I'm going to put four units up on the top of the hill, and nothing is going to impact any slopes over 30%. We would just be able to issue the permit because we could look at the size of the parcel and calculate whether there's enough density, and then go and say the bulk and the massing is okay, and you're not building on the 30% slopes. So therefore, there's no engineer that's needed for this project. To Do we have maps to know? But if you're doing the density, then you would have to because you would have to determine the amount of. So, but in that case, then they could say, well, my parcel is X number size, X number of square feet, so I'm going to only build on this flat area now. But in the future, I could build on that slope because according to my lot size, if, I, if we don't consider buildable area, then, then they can use any part of that site um, as long as it's not, say, restricted from building by 30% slope, and it may well not be. Yeah, and the way the they rules are worded anyway. right now, they no. can't build on the slopes over 30%. Right. When we get to the we have number to question, right. to, the yeah, number, to the lower number, then we'll, we'll get to the question of should we allow it with engineering, and we'll talk about some of the issues we've had to deal with. So 26 is only looking at calculating density based on buildable area only. Yes, and so, for the most part, this is this is fairly unique here. For the most part, most communities would say density is based on the size of your parcel. So maybe we can make a decision on 26 and then turn the discussion to 32, just so that we're not confusing the two aspects of this. I want to just talk about the density, buildable areas density first, then we can talk about pr the prohibition on building on 30% slopes altogether. So, um, what, what, we've heard a lot from Barb, which is good. You have the architectural background and the, not the done history. These, done these site plans. She yeah. knows these things. So, but I haven't heard from our newer members and I haven't heard much from you, Kirby. You've just been asking questions so far. So, since you have a little bit more history in this, maybe you want to start with your opinion. And then well, we I have a, I have a, actually, where I don't, have the history. <clears throat> I was just here for the end of the zoning, by the way, so I don't. I wasn't here for all of it. So I have a question about that. And the question is, uh, yeah, when, you, when <laughs> you when you were to when you because I know Mike did a lot of the work to determine was appropriate for density and, and did a lot of the density like background work. Did you factor in this buildable area thing and when the commission set those numbers or because I. For some reason, I'm thinking it came later. This buildable portion, like, like, like density was established from. It seems like separate from this concept. I think the density was probably just look. It was just looked at what's on 
the ground. We did 90% based on what's the, what's on the ground, not based on... 90% what's on the ground, and, and you did not factor in buildable. I... I no, that seems like that, not, yeah, that yeah, would have been too difficult been to do. That would have been a lot of work. Which means that if we follow what you're suggesting, then we're not really undermining that legwork you did, because you didn't really, you didn't factor it in anyway when we did, when you determined what was appropriate density. Does everybody follow what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, there was... But that, that was the <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, this is the problem with densities. It's very abstract. Yeah. But, I, I mean... So, so Mike did some background work to when, when, when the numbers, which are kind of arbitrary, were established for, for density for the zoning for the different areas. Um, he looked at what was there and kind of oh. based density off of if, if every... If we want to have 90% conformity in this neighborhood, okay. this is what the density would be. He didn't look at 90% of what was buildable, though. Oh, okay. He just looked at 90% okay. for all the square footage, which means if we follow his advice, then we're not like, really wrecking that idea at all. So if we did have a lot of public input talking to the public about the fact that these areas would be removed. So from a public standpoint, this is this would be a change of policy that we would make we'd have to make sure it was clear to the public in making mm -hmm. that change. I think we should make that change, but that's as I said, I think it clears up the administration side of things. Um, and then depending on how things go with the prohibition, it's it's been fairly standard in most other communities. If you had ten acres and five acres was wetlands you could still develop on the other five acres and you could cluster it. If you wanted to cluster your development, you could cluster your development assuming you could meet all the other parking bulk massing height requirements. And if, if you couldn't meet the parking That's where I'm, I'm persuaded to lift the buildable area layer on this because of all of the other protections in the zoning to require similar scale massing footprint. That's that's where I feel comfortable with doing that. Um, I think it was the concern about the Sibley Street building, which I'm not it's personally not, offended yeah. by, but I, I understand that the community like that, that at large that came out, they were not particularly happy about that. So that in mind. Yeah, Sibley was a project, it was an acre, they could have put 20 four units on that parcel and it's really steep and it has a flat spot on top so they were going to build on top they had the engineering surveys for this for the stability uh, underground parking 16 units um, but it was a 5,000 7,000 square foot building surrounded by mostly ranches you know downhill there, there were, were more larger multi-families multi -families, but as you got into the Sibley Street or those streets they tended to be some more at least duplexes smaller yeah, yeah. ranches we duplexes have, have yeah. yeah so it, that was a an issue for the community and so one thing we were trying to fix um, <coughs> so we were trying to fix a number of things with the zoning district with the new district map and the new density map one was there was this complete disconnect between the rules that were in effect and what was on the ground. Mm -hmm. So minimum lot size is 8,000 square foot, and 75% of the parcels had parcels that were smaller, smaller than that. Yeah, so we had, I don't think we a lot of people understood those. that the density that was hap is on the ground is a lot higher than what the prior rules mm -hmm. allowed for, and when we tried to match it, I mean, that's all we were trying to do yeah, is match. We were just trying to match what's on the ground with what was what the new rules would be. So we tr attacked it in a number of ways. One of which was so this. this administratively has become a nightmare because anytime anyone wants to increase their density in any way, they have Adding, to show yeah. a topo topo topographical survey about how much is buildable. Is that yeah? That what's happening? Yep. yep. So and we've been surprised with how many we've had like six applications in the first six months of this year. So. Okay. so just to make sure that I'm understanding this, I have this lot size. I'm allowed per whatever zone I'm in to build this particular size building. Mm -hmm. But if I can't do that without hitting a 30 degree slope that just doesn't physically work, that gets caught somewhere else, right? That gets what? It gets caught somewhere else. 
that I would have to, I would need some sort of survey to build on that. Like if I if I can build even if you could build with avoiding size, it, you would yes, need to prove part. that you can avoid it. Okay. Well, no, yeah. no, it's not. Yeah, it's not about what, where you can build or whether you're avoiding the slope. It's about how much room you have to play with in increasing your units. That's what twenty six is about. Yes. yes. Right. So if you get rid of that, then the only the trigger would be if I hit that slope, then I would have more. Then you would restriction. have. Yes. Right. Okay. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. I did try to put together an example yeah. of how this affects an actual parcel, which happened to be my own parcel. So mm -hmm. looking at that, with the, excluding the slope, mm -hmm. I excluded all the slope. Um, it looked like I could fit four units on it, which would mm -hmm. still be really high in terms of my, my neighborhood. Without it, I could put six or eight. So then it really starts to affect the neighborhood. And, um, you know, and I'm sure I could figure out some way to do it so I'd still be able to meet setbacks and parking and everything else on that flat area. So that, I mean, to me, that was the, the rationale was that what we want to do is match what's there and what's there are the pars are people building on the flat parcels in a way that fits in with the rest of the neighborhood. Regardless, because a lot of the, mm -hmm. I guess the other thing I should say is that a lot of the sites in Montpelier are, have narrow frontage and they're very deep. So, you know, I suppose technically they could maintain the neighborhood by building on the street in accordance with what else is there, but then they could build out back into the, the property, mm -hmm. potentially. Um, Assuming but, that's allowable anyway yeah. in their zone, it regardless would, of slope. Yeah, it's the bar, yeah, you still meet the bulk, the massing, and you know, the, the issue that comes up is um, looking strictly at, at density comparing to neighborhoods is a lot of the neighborhoods are built with larger single family homes. So if we start taking a large single family home and chopping it into smaller units, we've increased the density, but we really haven't increased. And that, that's where we're getting downstairs. Yeah. Most of our questions are, I've got three units, I wanna to go to four units. I've got four units, I wanna to go to six units. The buildings aren't getting any bigger. They're just either uh, developing undeveloped space, taking a vacant carriage house and putting two units in it, or uh, taking a large single level and dividing it to put another apartment in. Uh, and those are the issues that we're getting, and they're having to go back and do engineering plans for slope analyses where we're like, it's not changing the character of the neighborhood. Could we look at it from the standpoint if they're not changing the footprint or the, the if they're not adding on to any existing buildings, then then this would not be triggered. Well, how would, would that be different than just going and keeping them off the 30% slope? Because then for new construction or creating new additional buildings on the site, then that would be a, a limitation. I mean, I think that's that's where the character of the neighborhood starts to get affected is when more buildings appear rather than if it's an existing building that's just being developed in a more dense way that's I don't know less if I efficient. agree <laughs> I mean I, I it depends on what you're calling character of the neighborhood that's where I I just get nervous about it because I think you know we want to encourage development and we want to encourage people to tack on units to existing buildings where possible, so I, I just, I don't want to... But we have encouraged them to take existing buildings, existing large buildings, mm -hmm. and make multiple units. We're right, but every time they want to do that right now, they have to hire an engineer. That's what I'm hearing. Actually, not, not if they want a duplex, an existing single-family home. Maybe not a duplex, but anything bigger than a duplex. Well, yeah, and then, you know, then other issues come into play, but I think... Um, it, I guess my feeling is that I could no longer say to the public, yes, I think we've carefully considered these density levels um, and I find that they're appropriate um, if now we're going to allow the entire, um, the entire site. So to be what, what changes? Instead of a site that's three quarters of an acre that in fact one quarter can be developed, now we have you know, potentially three times as many units or twice as many units. 
So I think But the building sizes have to be the same because they're being they're they're governed by the other sets of rules that with with frontage right. but it doesn't mean that it couldn't I mean yeah because we've eliminated the frontage requirement that they well have, building so. size scale yeah. and footprint is what I was thinking yeah so um, and you know if we had sites in Montpelier that were not so defined the way they are you know most most cities have sites that are much more square you know the frontage is is a significant portion of the build of the site itself but we have so many because of our topography that we that are so long and narrow that uh, we end up with sites that have in the back portion of them might have 30 percent slope so we know anyway. you are not in favor of adopting <laughs> yes, staff's that's right. yeah. recommendation um yeah, i would be in favor of lifting the you want to make a motion to adopt staff's recommendation okay. um Sure, I'll make a motion to adopt staff's recommendation on number 26. I'll second. Any other discussion? I don't want to limit the discussion here. I just want to make sure we're conscious of time, too. Um, all right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. So we have three um, in favor. One opposed. What are the rules on you that? You would need to vote. I vote in favor, Barb. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Barb. <laughs> You're very passionate and persuasive. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a, a, but I'm going to say this is going to be a recommendation that will go to public hearing, and there will be then a public hearing on this before yes, it goes to council. Will. So this is. There will. But let's right. let's let's switch to 32, which is the prohibition on building on steep slopes now, because I think. We, the discussion will care it will flow well from and there. There's a third, yeah. And there's a third piece that we will get to later on on PUDs, which also affected is affected by slopes. So slopes. I think we should hit that after this one. I'll have to go and look up to see where that is. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. Um, so Walk three through, zero please. zero seven. Oh, before we move on. Okay. Your recommendation, by the way, was kind of open ended. So, are we clear about what zones you're going to exempt? Are we removing? Or, I removing the requirement. I understood so his recommendation to be clarified verbally as um, to, removing to it remove all it together. Entirely. Okay, so we're all clear on that. Okay. Um, Thank you. So three zero zero seven. Just so everybody knows, um, understands. So the steep slopes requirement has two tables and what these tables look at one tells you what your hearing threshold is so if you're disturbing only a small amount of 15 percent slopes then then it doesn't require hearing um, so there's thresholds that says when you're going to be kicked into a hearing with the drb and then there's a second set of rules that says when you need to hire an engineer to develop your plan for you. But what happens in both of these um, says, you know, disturbing 2,000 square feet or more um, of 25% slopes shall require hearing, 30% slopes, all development in this category is prohibited. And then same with engineering plan. It'll go and say no more than 4,000 square feet of land in the more than 25, less than 25% slope category, more than 25% slope category may be disturbed without an engineered plan. Above 30%, all development in this category is prohibited. So where this has become a significant issue for staff downstairs is that 30% slopes pop up all the time. And... Um, in small ways that are, you know, um, ditching on the side of the road on Spring Hollow Lane. Somebody wanted to do a subdivision and they needed to put in a culvert, want to put in a new driveway culvert. Well, the, to, to put in a culvert would require impacting a 30% slope and is therefore prohibited, so you can't put a culvert into a 30% slope. I mean, these were the types mm -hmm. of things, just little things that would come up that you're just like, oh, Somebody has a retaining wall 
and that retaining wall was long enough that it actually got more than 30, uh, got more than the 400 square feet or 450 square feet. There's a, a limit, and therefore you can't replace a retaining wall because a retaining wall is more than a 30 percent slope. It's actually a 90 percent slope. So retaining walls, you can't engineer. And we've had people come in and said, you know, this is just a pile of dirt. I can come in here with an excavator and have that 30% slope gone. It's not that big a deal, but you can't disturb any 30% slope. So it really started to become every time we turned around, we're hitting this thing where engineers are like, we can, we can engineer this. We can do this. We just have to cross this little stretch or there's a... a Wait, you know, kind of this big blob of 30%, it narrows up and it goes to a big blob of 30%, and they're like, oh, we can put the driveway through here without without an impact. We just have to slope it and drain it in this way and that way because it's not 30% here and it's not 30% there. There's just a short stretch. We've got to do a cut fill through. Can't do it because you can't touch that 30% slope. So what we wanted to be able to do was to, uh, the recommendation here, I believe, is just to go and say, just to change that language from saying all development is prohibited, just saying all development in this category shall require a hearing. And all development in this category um, may not disturb without an engineered plan. So the idea is just that we would put kick both of these, that any anything you do is going to require an engineer. Anything you're going to do is going to go to a hearing. So that way we can get through. Now that would potentially open up some larger projects, but the, the, the requirements are still here that you have to meet. You're not exempt from the design standards. Um, you still have to meet the design standards and you're still gonna have to have an engineer and it's still gonna be reviewed by a hearing. Uh, it just gives us some opportunities to be able to get in and make some reasonable accommodations. And if people have other ways of fixing the problem, I'm open to hear them, but yeah. that's the issues that we've been running into on a couple of projects. Will, do you want to comment on this? Yeah. yeah. Um, my question would be is, um, as far as what level of engineering, you know, obviously you can have a topography survey and know what your percentage is, but then um, soil tests, I mean, there's obviously there's a, there's a range of development, you know, I'm looking at another project here where we're putting in like a, 500 square foot sort of accessory dwelling, you know, single story, you know, and it would be sort of stepped into a hillside. And, you know, I mean, myself as a builder and designer, you know, I'm like, this should work. You know, basically, I can take that to an engineer and be like, does this work? And they'd be like, yes, it does work. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I guess I would just want to make sure that that's all clarified. You know, do we need soil boring tests and all that? So in addition to the site plan engineering, uh, soil engineering, and then structural engineering, those seem to be the, seat, the three things. And, and or what level of review is suitable, you know? I mean, if it's just like, you know, say a small corner of a potential addition that, you know, 85% 80, of the project is on less than 30%, and, you know, a small portion of it is on greater than 30%, does that require full survey, full engineering for you know the soils? Whereas, you know, the majority of excavators and concrete contractors that I work with are like, oh yeah, this will be fine. <clears throat> so I guess that's my questions as far as what level of engineering to take. You know, I guess if it's conditional and under review. Yeah, I guess what level? Of, you know, Have I you guess. ever asked for soil borings on this necessarily? On this particular project, not yet, you know, because we're not moving forward. It's in a very conceptual stage at this point. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a pattern of use is that there's a lot of existing development along. This is particularly on North Street um, where there's a lot of projects and houses that are kind of tucked on the uphill side of North Street. Um, you know, some of them probably have foundation issues because they were built in the 60s or something or before that, you know, with cinder blocks or dry stack stone. Modern techniques, you know, that shouldn't be a problem. You know, any smart design, obviously, would try to suit it to the site as well. So I guess that would be my question: is you know, as I said, if it's like you know, only 15% of a project is touching this 30%, do you then have to have the entire project, you know, soil tested and or um, 
structurally engineered. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is that there's a lot of site specificity that should be thought of in requiring engineering plans. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how much detail we want to get into in the zoning itself and how much we want to provide factors for the DRB to consider in setting the requirements for a given permit. Yeah, I mean, it could be the kind of thing, too, whereas, you know, I have an engineer out, and they're like, yeah, you should be fine with that, you know. And then whether it's a letter of, like, them saying, good to go. I mean, of course, most engineers... You mean an engineer certification? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think I know, like, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm a member of the DRB as an alternate, and there's been times where okay. we're like, you know, people have said, like, okay, you know, it's like, this subdivision, is it contingent on, you know, a septic system, you know, whereas some sides would be like, oh, we need to have a septic design, but then, you know, I was like, well, maybe we don't. Just a, a letter of intent from an engineer saying that, yes, you can put a septic system on here, and, you know, it will work. <clears throat> we don't need to have the full wastewater permit or the design and you know, all the engineering elements of that yet, but. We do have design standards in 3007 that talk about, you know, buildings that tuck into the grade. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Like that. Yes, so it's not like we're excluding any yeah. of those design solutions. Yeah, I think, yeah. Suggesting them. Yeah, good design is good design, and you know, it's like, you know, trying to fit the neighborhood or um, the site, important. But, you know, as I said, you know, if it's like, you know, 15% of a project is touching that 30%. Say it's 31%, you know. The difference between 31% and 29% is almost negligible. So I guess I would want to just have it be clear as to, like, at what point, you know, is it just across the board? If you're touching any 30%, the entire project needs to have engineering and what level of engineering you know, yeah, usually we're just looking at engineering the portion that's impacting the 30% slope. Yeah. But, you know, that's that's come up. When, when it goes to the hearing, the advantage of once something is going to the hearing, the applications, uh, the preliminary applications are sent to the different departments, including Public Works. Public Works has um, folks who are engineers and actually provide comments on what they want to see in and they required soil borings for the College Street project. They required borings for um, the Sibley project, even though that one didn't go forward. They did actually do the engineering on that one, did, did, did the soil borings. Um, and that's the, the folks downstairs know what to look for and the questions to ask. So um, yeah, I, I would, there is a process. I, would, I think that seems to make sense, you know, it's like, you know, DPW is saying, you know, it's one thing if you're putting like a 600 square foot accessory dwelling on like a 31% slope. It's another if you're putting a 6,000 square foot, four story, you know, building, you know, up above Berry Street. So obviously I think as Mike was saying that DPW's suggestions, you know, could be maybe the jumping off point. Of, what level of engineering because you know as you said there is engineers on staff that are very knowledgeable about a lot of things how consistent does dpw chime in like in practice uh they're pretty good of course it you know we always have to keep in mind you know when we're looking at something like zoning regulations that things work great with the staff that we have downstairs you know hopefully we keep having that staff for years and years to come but you know what happens if there's a change of staff downstairs that could change the dynamics of the information that's available to us we would probably at that point need to come up with a different solution from from an administrative standpoint to go through and say have uh, an engineer on retainer that we would be, have to then work with to get these types of questions answered so we may need a tweak in the future that would go through to set a process that would go through and say we're going to have a technical review. You know, the staff of the DRB reserves the right to have a technical review of any application, which is allowed under state law. Um, at this point, we don't need to do that because we have the staff downstairs. But and so the DRB relies on their assessment downstairs. Yes, they 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 take Tom and Kurt's comments very very carefully. Will could probably comment on, yeah. on that. They they take seriously any comments. If, if Tom had a serious concern with an application, 
you can bet the DRB is going to look very critically at it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that would make sense. You know, I mean, if DRB sees something that is a massive development, you know, when the majority of the project is on steep slopes, you know, I mean, I guess there's there's a variety of different situations. You know, you could be above a steep slope that then goes down, or you could be below a steep slope, you know, um, and I think they would be able to see what those sort of trigger points would be. It's like, oh, if just one corner of this project that's below a steep slope, you know, just make sure you reinforce that corner wall of the foundation or something. You know, but if it's like a huge building that potentially could slip downhill onto a public right-of-way, that's a different story, so. Just to kind of give a frame of reference for people, I mean, I, I think most people don't really understand what a 30% slope means. Yeah. And 30% is the maximum slope that you can grow grass on. So basically, if you see a slope that cannot hold grass because it's too steep, it's probably over 30%. Yeah, 30% 30, 30 slope is a very steep slope. Um, that's not to say that people all over the country don't manage to <clears throat> shelf things in on these steep slopes, um, but um, Hospital Hill is, is uh, driving up, so if you were on Route 302 driving up to the hospital, that's a 10% slope. So you think about something that's three times. On the, on the road, you mean? Yeah, the road. Yeah. If you were driving the road up from 302 up to the hospital, um, up Hospital Hill on Route 62, you'd be going up a 10% slope. So it just gives you an idea of 30% is just that much, you know. It's a pretty steep slope. Apparently we have a lot of those. We have a lot of 30% yeah. slopes, but not very many of them have been built on. Um, you, know, you know, you see a lot of red on the map, but if you were actually to go and look on aerial photo, you'd find that very little is actually developed on any of those 30% slopes. So you're saying that it, it comes up a lot, but are you, is it because of the retaining walls are it's triggering it? It's the smaller it? pieces that come in, um, that pop up, that technically, you know, unless we can find outs, we don't have it. And the other, so some of the other ways that could be addressed, these talk very black and white. Um, one option that doesn't appear in steep slopes is a waiver. So you're you you meet the rules or you or you don't. There's not a waiver provision that says, well, you can always go in and ask the DRB for a waiver to this requirement if you can find you meet these three requirements. So there are other ways of of getting uh, around this, but that's just, Kim's note, which is just criteria for DRB waivers should be stated. Yeah, if, if we were going to do the waivers idea, then it would be that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm trying to put some of these. I just put. A variety of ideas, ideas. Uh, and, and not really making clear, concise, this is exactly what we should do because there are a lot of ways we could address this. We just know from an administrative standpoint something has to change because these, the 30% prohibition is a, big, is a big problem just because of these small transitions. Um, I can think of a, there's a property, I don't think I'm giving anything away. There's a property that's terraced kind of goes up, it's flat, up, it's flat. And they want to just be able to work in between those two to um, remove because it's just it's it's just fill. They just want to be able to remove back to the other building so they can make a single larger building. So rather than having a, a kind of a shotgun on this flat spot, because it was up, flat, up, flat, with a shotgun house, and a shotgun, actually it's a shotgun apartment and a shotgun apartment, they just said, these are awful buildings. We just want to tear them both down and then build a single building that would kind of take that both that space and we could put mo many more units in here and really have a much nicer building and they can't disturb the slope that's between the two. So if we required engineer drawings, they would have to engineer, they would have to come in because they're disturbing 30% slopes, they would just have to have an engineer that would be a part of this project that would go through and say. So if there were problems to adjacent properties, then it would be the engineer who's on the hook. Yeah, we would be looking, well, they would. we would be able to ask the engineer to start to certify on things, you know. Well, it looks like you're gonna be moving, you're, you're at the toe of the hill, the bottom of the hill. How, how are you, what are you doing to prevent the, 
upper from becoming part of the lower, yes, you know, right, are you building right, retaining yeah. walls? Are you engineering these retaining walls? How are you engineering these retaining walls? Have you done soil borings to determine that there's bedrock so that top can't come down? Um, these are the questions that we can start asking. Um, Cause we, yeah, we did have a project that where that happened with a small house on top of a very steep slope. Yep, and then the other side is being and the guy at the top of the hill. And then suddenly the slope started to move, you know. Because yes. of the weight of the building and there's no, yep. There, and there wasn't any engineering as far as I knew. Anyway. Yep. And that's what we want to be able to do is be able to make those assessments at the top and the bottom of the hill. We don't think there's going to be a lot of people who are really going to try to go in. Um, you'll see it in, in some communities that have had issues where they've gone through and, and had people take a long, steep slope, and somebody will find a way to try to stick their house on the side of that hill. I don't, we don't, we haven't had that. This would still prohibit that if, if, if it isn't going to be properly done or it's going to affect um, some other issues because it is a public hearing. It is, it's tripped it into a hearing. Even if it's a permitted use, a single family home, it's a permitted use and you want to build in there, you're still going to a public hearing. Because of the waiver? Because of steep slopes. Oh, well, if oh. we, if we, the, the, the requirements of. Well, there's no way to do it at all right now. Right, right? now, there's no way to right. do it at all. But so you're all. suggesting you that if it? there were to be a waiver or there were to be a conditional use, it would be a situation where the slopes on the property or the, the slopes slopes at the site where the development is proposed would trigger the need for a hearing and an engineering an engineer drawing right yes well, yeah we could and yeah. the denial of the conditional use like if 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 the drb wasn't satisfied um do we feel comfortable that the criteria is there for them to make a decision to make a denial decision that would hold up i don't require think, new criteria i don't think i think I think we have to come up with it. It's okay. I'm hearing, that's that's right? what I want. Is that to right, Mike? Well, we already have nine standards in H. They can establish uh, clearing, limit the amount of disturbance of existing natural vegetation, not create steeper slopes than 30%. So you can't fill onto a 30% slope and make it even steeper. Right. I mean, we have a lot of uh, design standards here, so maybe... Yeah, maintain and reduce pre-existing rate, produce a final grade that is compatible with surrounding terrain, create harmonious transition uh -oh. between graded and terrain, avoid creating continuous unbroken slopes or linear slopes, contour graded slopes by varying slope increments to produce a final grade that undulates both vertically and horizontally, very cut fills. So which where which provisions are you reading from? These here? are from 3007H, the design standards for steep slopes. And that they could all be things that the DRB denies an application on. Yep. And okay. these these I'm same satisfied. rules apply even down to 15% slopes. It's just you need to disturb 4,000 square feet or more on a 15% slope before you get booted into the hearing and needing to meet this requirement. But does it be anything over 30 then? Okay. Yes. And yeah, you can't do anything over 30% without criteria. triggering these. So Mike, how can you make that determination if they don't have an engineer drawing in terms of the 4,000 square feet or more of land in the slope category greater than 15%? You st they're still going to have to have an engineer drawing even though we don't require it and except for figures three they, nine. they may yeah they may end up needing to have engineering for an administrative approval as well uh -huh. so it almost seems like if we if we can't downstairs if we don't feel we have the information to approve it then we have to deny it so usually what we end up doing is telling them you're going to need to give us additional data so we can know you know you're not going to have to go to a public hearing because you're not getting high enough in square footage. I think. Yeah. If we, the, the other option, I, I'm looking here, so 4,000 square feet of land shall require a hearing, 8,000 square feet may not be disturbed without an engineered plan. 
almost we could like make them the same. It almost seems like it makes sense to make them the same. If you're gonna, yeah, if you're gonna go to a hearing, the, the DRB, I would be very surprised to see the DRB not, not want to hear an engineer yeah. on a steep slope project. Yeah, I was wondering about those two, but I assumed that there was some way you had to administer this magically without the plan. <laughs> yeah, we did a lot, because initially they were like completely Different. not connected, and so we kind of made them mm. more logical halfway through, and I think looking at this, I would almost expect to see those numbers reversed. I would almost expect to see an engineered plan requirement. You'd trigger an engineered plan requirement before you trigger a hearing. Right, because then you might be able to make an administrative, administrative decision, decision with a smaller using area. A smaller that area. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, with all this in mind, I mean, do you have a specific recommendation for us? Regarding this last thing we've just been talking about, or with the steep slopes, my thought was just to go and remove those rather than say all development is prohibited, just say all development shall require a hearing. Instead of all development or all disturbance uh, is prohibited, it would say all disturbance shall require an engineered plan. So I think that's my recommendation in here that I would go with. And then the question, if we want to adjust those numbers to be the same, I would probably think I would make them the same. See the hearing. Yeah. My or else reverse them. Or or else reverse them. Because then you could avoid it. So this is the number of yeah. square footage that would trigger the need for. Yeah, there's one. Engineered so plans versus yeah, a hearing. Yeah, there's one number that says when you need a hearing, and there's one number that says you need to provide an engineered plan. Currently, you can go to a hearing without needing an engineered plan. If you get And then you go to the hearing, and they tell you. That doesn't make as much sense. I would expect these numbers should have been reversed. The eight thousand should have been this number, and the four thousand should have been this number. It's small, you know, it's not the right size. So it makes it easier for you, hopefully. If we yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense to switch, switch those, those then? Yes. Switch the eight thousand and the four yes. thousand. I think we we, we can switch them or make them match. I mean, if we switch them, then I would, probably would you switch. be able to do administrative decisions? We'd probably, we'd more likely. I would switch. I would probably switch them because it's more likely we would. I think where we can do yeah. administrative decisions, we want to do yeah. that because we yeah. want to streamline yeah. permitting yeah. process the best we can. With yeah, yeah, because yeah, we will go walk across the hall and talk to Kurt as well when we need an opinion on. So that means clearing that <laughs> four thousand square feet of disturbance on a slope of less than fifteen percent. Greater than. Greater, 15. greater than fifteen percent, but less than what's the next one? Twenty. 20. Between 15 and 20 percent would be engineer plans would be required, but not necessarily a hearing. Yes. Um, so Leslie, it might just take the numbers on those two yep. and completely switch them. Yeah. Not just for one category, but for all. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, yeah, I must have. Just I don't know how we ended up with those numbers necessarily, but. I'm guessing it came from somewhere. So we're recommending a switch of numbers for figure 3-08 and 3-09. Um, and then as for number 32, <laughs> I understand staff's recommendation to take off the prohibition on development on th over 30% slopes, but make it a requirement that engineering plans and a hearing are required? Yes. yes. I guess this sort of goes on your question, your, you know, the, which is the engineering and which is a hearing. You know? Yeah. It seems like, at least from my perspective, it should be a similar, you know, different categories, you know, because I mean, obviously a certain square footage of development can require a certain major site plan review, which would be DRB and whatnot, you know, if it's a Five, as I keep bringing up this 500 square foot accessory dwelling unit, you know, it's like, whereas we could, if it was on a 32% slope, have the engineer drawings go to the staff and be like, here's our project, and they can be like, good to go. You don't need to go to the DRB. You know, as I said, you know, there's other things within the regulations that require you to go to the DRB no matter mm -hmm. what. Right. Know, for yeah. Coverage or 
the major site plan reviews versus the minor site plan reviews. So I guess that would be my two cents about that. You know, it's a similar, you know, I don't have a problem with, you know, no matter what, anything above 30% being engineered. You know, but if we have to do engineer and DRB versus just administrative. I think that is where we're landing on this. If it's if it's more than thirty percent, it's going to require both, right? That that's what I'm under. I'm yeah. I'm just trying to pin down what the staff recommendation is on this because I think that yeah, all slopes, Mike tries to do less process where he can. All slopes over thirty percent. All slopes over thirty percent require hearing, and all slopes over thirty percent require engineering. So that'd be both, no matter what. If it's over thirty percent, over thirty percent. So, but we were talking more like in like if it's like a fifteen yeah, percent, then that. you yeah. could. It's, yeah. We're making it easier to get administrative is, approval yeah, for fine. that. I was wondering if you were thinking about maybe incorporating that into the above the thirty percent as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we're taking a big step by removing a prohibition. So <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate where you're coming from, but I don't know that we're ready to go that far. Um, it, yeah, and there's still of requirements of. Isolated slopes of greater than 500 square feet in area, you know, so you, you still have some that might not have to go to a hearing if it's a really small amount of 30% slope. But there's, it's still in there, but it's, it, that's really meant for isolated areas. But it'll still probably get caught up in these other administrative requirements. So I think, I think it's good. So do I have a, a motion to adopt the staff recommendation as articulated just now? <laughs> Whatever that was. Well, Mike has written it down. Switch, switch square switch, footages yeah. of 300, uh, 308 and 309. Okay. And all slopes over 30% will require hearing, and all slopes over 30% will require engineering. Or as opposed to prohibition. Yes. So. I will move that recommendation. I'll a second. second. Any further discussion on this? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Well, I don't have to vote on this we one. Got that one. <laughs> Mike, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Act 250, you're pretty familiar with that, right? Yeah. Don't they prohibit development on slopes over 30%? I don't think so. I don't think, do, I don't think it's an outright. And if they do, it has triggered. to get triggered, yeah. Well, Act 250, 250 and, jurisdiction, no, I'm not yeah. I'm saying in the city, but I'm saying yeah. in any project that has to go before Act 250 yeah. review. So, I, I mean, there's know, rationale for this. Yeah, words. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it's. Out yeah, I, I would think it would always require engineering if there were, but I don't know if it's out, if there's any outright prohibition of. So, we'll rely on our engineers to do the right thing, huh? Well, they're going to, they get vetted. This is not just stamp it and it's okay. Mm -hmm. This is you present. An engineer report, and we give it to our engineer to double check. And our and they've been pretty. They push back pretty hard. They come back and go and say, you know, don't like I don't like thing. your conclusions. Uh, you know, I would rather see a spread foundation rather than, you know, piles driven or whatever. They yeah. they'll go. They, they get pretty detailed with their interpretations of what they think. They're working off of a lot of experience with other. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Okay. So there was another one connected to steep slopes, um, the PUDs, and I, I think that was, let's see, for 62, is that, is that it, Mike? Well, let's see. Maybe. Yes. So, and there may be some other ones that pop up. So where this, so where steep slopes kind of came up a couple times was in the density and whether we build or don't build. And then when we start talking about planned unit developments or clustering, then we it comes up again. Do you get to count those? those densities and do you need to conserve those areas first? 
So I think what we found in a couple of them, like Cottage Cluster, and I haven't, knowing, knowing the decisions that have been made for 26 and 32, kind of want to go and see maybe what, how that will impact these later discussions because like conservation areas so this is this, this is 62 and this is Jay Ansell's comment is that right thank you yes um, we should save some time and find out um, whether we're answering her question when she comes oh. up oh yeah maybe we can pause for a moment do you want to I think Actually, maybe the one that I'm waiting to hear about. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good because we probably wouldn't have gone there if we went in order. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you're you're concerned about the the cottage clusters and okay, great. Land unit development. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and we did get an email from Jay Ansel on this as well. So first, well, we'll get Mike to summarize, and then we'll maybe we can get your comment after he summarizes. Or you just want to listen? I do want to listen. Okay. I might have a little to say, but probably not. Okay, great. So where this is, comes up is when we start talking about conservation areas and what gets conserved, the steep slopes comes up again. So you have to conserve 30% slopes first and 15 to 30% slopes second. Um, and I want to say, because it depends, we have um, five different types of PUDs. Right. I think this is the conservation, the open space. Yeah. So one is infill. I don't think infill PUDs no. would be affected much. What do you think it much. is, Barb? I'm confused. If you're looking at number 62, we're just talking about adding a general PUD section. I think that was, without any yeah, density that's bonuses. not... I think it's a different one that's out here, but not that one. Okay, so which one are we? But I do know that where Jay's concern has been is We, we don't have a copy of the Jay Ansel email. There's yeah. one on the table yeah. over there. Um, that one. No, this is only the Yeah, that you've got yeah. um, um, So his first... I just missed it, I guess. His first concern was to allow PUDs in all undeveloped areas of the city. New neighborhood conservation and cottage cluster to be allowed in all the undeveloped areas. In other words, not restricted by district. Right? Yes. And I think we have some recommendations in here for a couple of those. Okay, so we, we're, it may not be number 62. We're just jumping in the wrong spot. So I think one of them is um, number 61. Recommend allowing new neighborhoods in Western Gateway, Eastern Gateway, and residential 24,000. That's pretty much... Jay's request before his earlier discussion with me was the fact that he was referring to I think he had a project that was East Eastern Gateway is out by Gallison Hill and Tractor Supply and you know we had pretty much gone through and said oh that's kind of urban and he kind of said well actually there's some undeveloped land in there that could be a nice mixed-use project, and if I had access to this PUD, I could do some something in there. So I think he was referring that Western Gateway uh, includes National Life, so I think mm -hmm. we could all think of a nice new neighborhood PUD that could go up on National Life, but it's not allowed today. Um, and then Residential 24,000, which is the college so and yeah the new neighborhood PUD um, can you give a quick 
overview of new neighborhood PUD is kind of the it's the traditional neighborhood development. It's yes, the, that's right. Uh, it's to encourage new neighborhoods. I mean, this is reading right from the purpose in a manner consistent with traditional development principles and patterns of neighborhoods built in Montpelier before 1940. Traditional neighborhoods combine a variety of housing types, small scale commercial, civic uses in a compact walkable setting, features highly connected street networks, sidewalks, buildings set back appropriate to create public realm on a human scale, providing parks and open space to maximize protection of significant resources. So if you want to build a, a big development, if you do it in a way that meets this PUD, you get density bonuses. And, um, we had uh, a few potential lots in mind when we were coming up with this and some of the bigger lots in town. Um, and we apparently neglected to consider all of the potential lots. So that's what I understand your recommendation is that it would be a no-brainer to expand the districts to which this PUD could be applied. Yes, that would make, it would make a lot of sense that we would allow this in, in more places than we've allowed it. So saying yes to 61. Would, would, this, would this make it more attractive to build on the outskirts of the city as opposed to the downtown area, though? I mean, that could have been one of the reasons why we didn't do it that way. Um, but this would be its own little... It's not, you're worried include, about suburban sprawl. Basically, doesn't include I mean, rural, it doesn't include rural, so you can't develop in areas that don't have access to sewer and water. So this would be limited just to areas that have access to sewer and water. I mean, I think the thing about this PUD is that, yeah, it may be not walkable to downtown, but it would be a, a pocket community that would be walkable within that community. So it wouldn't be suburban sprawl in that you would have to, you know, drive from one house to another house to another house. So if you are going to develop, you're going to have to do it in, in sort of a concentrated manner. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm generally in favor of any new housing. I'm just want to make sure we're not undermining a lot of yeah what we're doing just to kind of acquiesce this request. It seems yeah. like this is really intended for a new neighborhood, as opposed to a particular cluster. Cottage cluster kind of comes in under a different PUD, which might more easily fit into the denser area. And that's why I want to make sure we're being careful, because I mean, a yeah. new neighborhood is a much Larger impact will impact the impact. city for right. you know yeah. decades, if you know, or longer. And currently, we're allowing it where, Mike? It's allowed in riverfront, mixed use, residential, residential three thousand, residential six thousand, residential nine thousand, on parcels that are two acres or more in size. So the proposal would expand it to East and West Gateway. In residential 24. Four. I mean, your point's really good that we could end up having this sort of isolated pocket of a neighborhood here. Um, but at the same time, I think that all of those districts are somewhat developed already anyway. It so. would help to know, I'm, I'm not, I'm having, I'm having trouble picturing on the Eastern Gateway where this would be. Eastern Gateway, so Eastern Gateway is? Could include up places, um, like just undeveloped two acre yeah. parcels. Yeah, right? National yeah. Life, I think, is the. Well, east for Eastern Gateway, you've got parcels like. Um, so Pat Malone's got some parcels that would be that big. I think Jason Merrill. Um, so if you were across from Tractor Supply, you've got a big hill. That's a six. That's a six acre parcel, six seven acre parcel. So if they wanted to do some neighborhood development on the top of that hill because it doesn't fit for commercial, maybe there would be a residential infill that could go there. Um, as you move down that street, there are a number of and undeveloped and underdeveloped parcels that could. That's like more than a mile from downtown, right? It's, it is but something from a planning. the new bike path is gonna connect it. <laughs> something from a planning perspective that we have recognized as a challenge. Um, 
was that we have areas in town that have access to sewer and water and have been developed and can develop and the question is what do we do with them because they're not supporting the downtown where there's some resistance to doing a lot of development downtown we do want development downtown we do want stuff to happen there but at the same time when things happen there there's also a pushback about losing our historic character because of of doing that so we kind of got to find a place where we can just got to do it in a way that maintains historic character and balance that support in the downtown so we do have a little bit of challenges but when we did our wrapped up our city plan master plan we noted there were two areas um, that were challenging Um, one was this route 302 what are we going to do with this you Mm -hmm. know it doesn't support our downtown but has sewer and water and kind of should find out how we want to plan for this do we want more (coughs) development out there more mixed use development out there or do we just not want development out there and then the other one are some of our neighborhoods um that are lower density neighborhoods like Town Hill. These are the areas that came up with a lot of comments, a lot of challenges. Yes. What do we do with these areas that have access to sewer and water, but people don't want to infill? And um, we, we need to come up with what's, what's appropriate and what's our plan. I mean, we come up with a solution that works for zoning, but is that really our, our long-term plan to continue to have one acre zoning? Kind of. And if we we need a parcel that's big enough to develop a new neighborhood, I mean, you were talking to up to 40 units for each, yeah, 40 I, lots or units. That I, I'm, I'm challenged to give away too much without cons- giving away too much because, you know, people come and talk to us about things. And that's how we come up with these is people come in and go and say, well, I've got a great idea for this parcel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can't really go into the details of it just fits for you know we can think about it generally from eastern gateway western gateway western gateway mostly it's like ne- your national life hill yeah um, i mean that one makes sense to mm-hmm. me because potentially it is walkable to downtown mm-hmm. i hear um, that potentially yeah and eastern gateway it makes sense to me too except when i start thinking about we want so much development to be concentrated in smart ways we want smart growth and then the only thing that we're the only major project we'll be successful in is one that's more than a mile from downtown. I feel like that would be like a failure if like if we're not encouraging I don't know. If we well, just, we are uh, using a lot of other tools to encourage infill and other types of PUDs like cottage clusters which are very yeah. much they're a lot smaller. This is the bigger scale new neighborhood meaning like not just cluster or units but also mixed uses and um, so yeah. It, it, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, I feel like it would be, in, from my perspective, it would be a success if it, you know, maybe it's mixed use, but it adds some more housing units and people mm-hmm. are moving in from like East Montpelier, you know, like they're getting a little bit closer in, like maybe they're not walking, but they're, you know, I think that's a positive. Part, thinking about I, we need better transportation. Part part of I think part of maybe why I'm a, why I'm a little concerned is I don't think these I think these are people this is the downsizing group is mentioned here and those are people oh. who already live here oh, okay. and are looking for okay. a smaller place to live here, yeah. which is like I'm great that that's happening. Yeah, yeah. What they want. Let's do some infill downtown and let's yeah. have your downsizing group do that. But what, whatever the reasons are behind the suggestion, overall it would increase housing stock, which is our goal. I mean, if we look at the, uh, you know, Montpelier, sustainable Montpelier plan, it certainly looked at more housing developed in new neighborhoods in the Western Gateway, for sure, of your national life. Mm-hmm. And um, There is a lot of potential. Yeah, there is a lot of potential. I'm not sure if on the other end of the city, if we trip into Eastern Gateway or not, yeah, it did. some of what they yeah. were proposing. Yeah, the Grossman's Lots, Eastern Gateway, where the parking would be. Where the parking would be, yeah, but not. there was no housing proposed east of that, right? Yeah, but the idea being um, if that same concept were to continue with the rail with the rail line through Berlin that we would then be able to develop more of a linear city mm-hmm. connecting transit, very no. city transit transit oriented design connecting those so, so what's, what's residential 24,000 
Residential, residential twenty four thousand. That is would, would clearly be the the college. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's that the, the one, and that includes the the one above it too. So, um, number sixty one talks about new neighborhood adding it to residential twenty four thousand. Number sixty talks about adding cottage cluster to residential twenty four thousand, which I think is just an oversight in. Yeah, I labeled it as green. Sorry, which one did you just? 60, 60 and 61. So 61 was the new neighborhoods. Okay. 60 would add cottage cluster as an option for residential 24. Oh, okay. That was a consent item. So as far as 61, I'm hoping we can get a little resolution on this before we adjourn. So um, do I have a motion to adopt step recommendation on 61? which would be to allow new neighborhood PUDs in Western Gateway, Eastern Gateway, residential 24,000 districts. I'll move. I'll so move. A second. Can, can I request that we, can we hold off? Is it possible to hold off on Eastern Gateway and for the next time? I mean, I'd like to just okay, look at it. Okay, we can limit it. it. Yeah, I mean, we could okay. just make it for Western Gateway and um, residential 24. Yeah. Oh, the I, movement, I you're the right. movement, so if you want to modify right, yes, your motion, I you're will welcome. I will modify my motion, and okay. we will hold Eastern Gateway in abeyance right now. Okay. okay. Just make it Western and residential 24,000. Okay. Second on that? Second. Okay. You're, and any further discussion on that one? Are you comfortable? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. So that carries. Yeah, I'd like to look... Um, I, I see what you're saying, but then I'm also relating to when I was trying to buy a house in Montpelier and the fact that, mm -hmm. and yeah, I know you did this recently mm -hmm. too, it's significantly cheaper and easier to buy five acres in Cabot. And from a regional perspective, are we trying to encourage yeah. people to buy five acres in yeah. Cabot? And I'm, and I'm, um, and I'm, and so I'm, that's yeah, and I'm part totally of my thought, but then I'm, I'm also, totally I want to look at yeah. what the specific requirements are of doing a PUD because that's what I don't fully understand, which relates to what, what could that look like? I, I'm, I, what I'm worried about, and I just want to check it out, and I think I'll feel better, but I'm, I am worried about us doing something desperate for housing and, and, and like kind of like no, making right. a mistake yeah, that no, we absolutely. regret. Yeah. So just, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm as desperate of, for housing as anyone. Yeah, but. and part of the land use planning that goes out to that section of Route 302 really comes back to it's, it's not designed for urban. There are no sidewalks out there. And so part of this is to come up with our, when we do our land use plan for our master plan, our city plan, mm -hmm. is to start to go and say, if, if we're going to be urban and we're going to be mixed use, then we've got to start acting like we're going to be mixed use. And we've got to start putting in sidewalks and putting in street lights yeah. and making this look urban. Because mm -hmm. yeah. if we think this is going to, you know, be... Right. Something in right. between. Maybe we should call it something other than gateway. Like yeah, I mean, yeah, that's true. But oh no, don't change the name again. But, yeah. but it is the gateway to the community. It's it gonna. Is. It, it people is. are going to remember. People remember your communities by the gateways and how right. you. Right. And and you're right about the transit-oriented development. You know, if, if the train actually could go out there, then it makes more sense. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think it has the eastern gateway has many more considerations. Than yeah, Western Gateway gets right. actually in some parts gets very close. So, any anything that you want to say before we adjourn? Because I think we're um, wrapping I, up the discussion. Twenty four that residential twenty four thousand was the specific area that I was hoping to hear about. So I have, and then I I'm just curious because cottage clusters is another one. Did that piece get added, Mike? Was did I hear you say that was just an oversight it's, to sixty? Is it's a cons it's a consent item, which I don't know how if we're gonna. Specifically is everyone address. comfortable with staff recommendation on that? Yeah, mm -hmm. no one raised it as an issue. So, um, and hearing confirmation here, we're gonna deem it approved. So yes, okay. We didn't act on sixty two, correct? We did not no. act on sixty two. Okay. I think we need to talk about that one a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I gave you the wrong minutes. I went to the yeah. bottom of the minutes. I, I quickly just, was like, I need minutes. It's I opened okay. them up, went to the bottom, opened it's that okay. one, hit print. So our um, item eight, we're gonna we're gonna hold off on considering minutes from July 9th um, till our not our next meeting. Our next meeting is August thirteenth, and it'll be with uh, more committees at the pavilion building. But at the following meeting after that, which is I think it's August twenty seventh. 
I think probably the three of us will probably meet at some point, or maybe the four of us, just to go over logistics. Logistics. Yes, I think that's a great meeting. idea. So yeah, just because I think we've got to be comfortable with exactly what the agenda is and how it's going to march. Yeah. Yes, I I think that's are. a great idea. And I'll just come okay. to you, and you'll just give me the money, right, for the refreshment. Always have yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do I have a, a motion to adjourn? Motion. Okay. And a second. <laughs> second. Barb seconded. So we had Stephanie moved. Barb seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. We are adjourned.